I shall be chiefly calling your attention this morning to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12 and 13, and you may like to have your Bible open at that place. Over the period of Easter, we have been thinking a great deal about the two great and central events in the life and work of our Lord Jesus Christ as he became our Savior, his death and his resurrection. And we have been emphasizing that you cannot divide between the death and resurrection of Jesus. His death requires his resurrection as God's seal on the sufficiency of his sacrifice actually to take away our sin. And we have seen the resurrection as God's amen upon Jesus' death, his acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice his seal on what Jesus has done. Now this morning I want to go on to point out to you from the scripture that just as you cannot separate the death of Jesus from his resurrection, neither can we separate the death and resurrection of Jesus from the next event in our Lord's saving work, namely his ascension into heaven where he sat down on the right hand of God's majesty, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God then to wait until his enemies should be made a stool for his feet. Now although we are inclined to think less about the ascension of Jesus, and most of us I think find ourselves doing this, there is a Sunday in the Christian year known as Ascension Sunday, which we seldom observe, I suppose. We don't think very much about the Christian year apart from Christmas and Easter. Anyway, but that's because we're Presbyterians rather than Anglicans, perhaps. But the Ascension is an important element in the whole of our thinking about what our Lord Jesus has done if we are to understand the full salvation that he has achieved for us by all that he has accomplished. And it occupies a crucial place in what Jesus came to do as our Savior. It seems to me an important thing for us to think of it and grasp its significance immediately in the aftermath of Easter. Jesus himself, do you remember, challenges his disciples about this when they were doubting him. What he says in John 6, 62, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? He urges Mary in John 20, 17, do not touch me, I am not yet ascended to my Father. And he urges her to go and proclaim this message to the disciples, tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. It's certainly an essential part of apostolic preaching of the gospel. In 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul urges Timothy, Great is the mystery of our religion. And here is the Christian religion. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. Now that's an essential element in the sweep of the gospel. He was taken up into glory. And you remember when in Romans 8 Paul is throwing out his challenges about the believer's eternal security in Jesus Christ. He says, who is to condemn us? Is it Jesus Christ who died, who was raised from the dead? Yea, rather, who is at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. I wonder if you caught that note in the choir's anthem this morning. He is there in the presence of God interceding for believers. You notice how the death and resurrection and ascension and exaltation of Jesus are bound together then as Paul explains how he saves and keeps us. Now it is particularly to the significance of the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of the Father that I want us to turn for the rest of our time this morning. 
There are four things mainly that I want to say about it, of which the first is a kind of preliminary. The ascension of Jesus in the first place, and we deal with this briefly, poses a problem, at least for some people. The problem derives from the story we read in Acts chapter 1 and the very language it uses to describe Jesus as he was taken up and a cloud received him out of his sight and the messengers to them said, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. What are we to make of this idea of Jesus then defying the law of gravity and going up into heaven? Many people have been concerned about this and you may have seen in a religious newspaper recently some concern exercised about the whole fact that we believe in a literal ascension. Let me say at once that it seems to me that the God who created the law of gravity can equally well suspend it if this is his purpose. It seems to me an extraordinary thing that we might believe in the defying of the law of death in the resurrection of Jesus, but we don't want to defy the law of gravity in his ascension. And these things seem to me dealing in trivia in some sense. But it's important for us to grasp that the significance of the ascension does not lie in this whole question of the defying of the law of gravity. It is not a miracle and wonder in that sense only. The word heaven into which Jesus ascended is used in three ways in the scripture. It's used first of all for the sky or the air as Jesus uses it in the Sermon on the Mount speaking about the birds of heaven literally. That's the birds who fly in the air. It's used secondly for the whole realm of space as we would call it, the sun and moon and stars, the heavens declare the glory of God. And that's the second way, the visible universe and the universe also that is an invisible. Thirdly, the word heaven is used on, mainly in the plural for God's unlimited power and sovereignty. So in the Old Testament, Satan says, I will ascend to heaven I will be as God. Or the scripture speaks of heaven as God's throne. That is, it is his sphere of government and glory. And so Jesus teaches us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. Now that does not mean that heaven is not a place. I'm sure heaven is a place. Heaven is a place where we in glorified bodies which are as real as Jesus' glorified body was real, will go to be with him and will worship him and serve him and so on. But the vital thing is that the thought that is here is the thought of God's unbounded power and supreme authority. And this is what Jesus directs us to in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, it is the place of supreme authority and power. And the term heaven and the right hand of the Father are related in Scripture to the earth so that heaven becomes almost another name for God. The prodigal son says, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And he means I have sinned against God. Therefore we are obviously speaking when we speak of Jesus ascending into heaven to his ascending to the right hand of God, to a place of supreme authority, to the unbounded glory and power which is in heaven, which Jesus now shares with the Father. But that does not mean that he did not rise literally. It would have been the obvious method indeed for Jesus to leave this world, to declare that his physical appearances were at an end, and that he was going to be with his father in that realm where he was to reign in glory. And from there to send his Holy Spirit so that he might be universally present, as one of the children said, in the world. So it poses a problem for some people, but the problem is usually due to a misunderstanding. Secondly, it proclaims a message. That message is, of course, most obviously that Christ ascends to glory as the victor over sin and death and hell and Satan. 
Now this is the significance of the ascension in terms of what our Lord Jesus did as the Savior of men. It is his ascension that proclaims to us that he is the mighty victor who has arisen from the grave, not only victor over death, but victor over all the legions of Satan, over every power of darkness, over the whole dominion of sin, and he soars into the glory as the one who is in triumph, taken up to the right hand of the Father, waiting, you will notice in Hebrews 10:13, waiting until his enemies should be made a stool for his feet. That is, until every area of the universe recognizes what has become true, that is, that Jesus is the King of Kings. Now, this, of course, is the message that you discover in so many areas of the Bible. In Ephesians 4, for example, when Paul is speaking about the gifts that the Lord Jesus distributes to the church, he says, Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, who is the Lord Jesus who is the king and head of the church? Who is the Lord Jesus who is scattering his largesse upon the church of God and providing gifts and blessing and grace and power? He is the one who is exalted to the Father's right hand, having led captivity captive. Now, my dear friends, for many of us, for all of us this morning who are here, it is abundantly important to grasp that vision of Jesus. Have you ever seen it in the 24th Psalm? We were speaking of this on Wednesday evening at the Bible study. The 24th Psalm that we sing often at communion, you know, ye gates lift up your heads on high. It's a messianic psalm. It speaks not only of a king who is entering into his authority, but of the Lord Jesus entering into his glory. And this is what Paul is looking at when he says he ascended up on high and led captivity captive. It is the Lord Jesus going, born into the presence of God with ten legions of angels, and as the ramparts of heaven, as it were, are full of those who are craning over, waiting upon his return, they cry out, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and let the King of glory in. And back from heaven there comes the response, Who is this King of glory? And they cry, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, He is the King of glory. Open the gates and let Him in. And into the presence of the Father there goes this mighty conqueror, carrying with him all the train of his victory. My dear friends, that is where our Savior is today. This is the kind of Savior he is. Now you see what that means. It means that the ascension of Jesus proclaims that the triumph of God over all the powers of darkness is complete and nothing, neither death nor hell nor sin, can ultimately triumph over you if you are God's child and Christ's subject. And it's that that puts backbone into the weakest believer. The ascension proclaims Christ as the conquering victor. Look ye saints, we began our service singing. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now from the fight returned victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. And that is the issue. It is really only a matter of time, you see. That's the future of the world. There is a sense in which it is only the Christian believer who understands the future of the world. The future of the world is not uncertain or unknown. The future of the world is not in the hands of people in Moscow or Peking or Washington or London. The future of the world is in the hands of the one who is at the right hand of the Father this morning. And he is waiting until all his foes become his footstool. 
But there is another element in the message of the ascension which I want to draw your attention to. It concerns Jesus being seated at the right hand of God. You notice when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now here is God taking the trouble to explain to us what our Lord Jesus is now doing in order that we might grasp the significance of what he has already done. He is sitting in a posture of rest after some piece of work has been completed. That's the whole picture. And Christ, who is our great high priest, is different from all these other high priests that are described in Hebrews 10. They are constantly standing. They never sit. There were no seats in the temple for them. They are all the time standing. They are all the time busy because they are seeking to atone for sin. But Jesus is a high priest who is seated because all his work is ended. That's what we sing in the hymn. Jesus hath ascended glory to the King. All his work is ended. And what we are speaking about when we speak of our Lord's sacrifice is what Hebrews here says, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down and he sits down to clarify for us that there is nothing more to be done. Now, my dear friends, that is the best of good news for people who are seeking to get right with God, for men who are wondering how their consciences can be cleansed, how their guilt can be taken away, how they can be put right with God. The seated Jesus in glory declares to us, it is finished, it is done, there is no more to add to it. I have accomplished it. That's what he's saying. May I say to you this morning, have you cast your anchor into that hope? Have you rested your soul there this morning? Not in anything that you can ever do or become, but on Jesus and his finished work. For that's what the ascension proclaims to us. It is finished. But there is something else that this message of the ascension proclaims to us also. It proclaims to us that whatever else we see as we look into the face of our Lord Jesus in his exalted glory, he is a Savior who understands the needs of his people. Now that brings us to the third thing. It not only poses a problem and proclaims a message, it provides a comfort. And that comfort derives from many things, but it derives perhaps chiefly from this. What is Jesus doing in heaven? Well, what he is doing in heaven, according to the epistle to the Hebrews, is he is ever living there to make intercession for his people. He is seated, but he is not inactive. He is seated, but he is engaged all the time in a ministry. What is that ministry? We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, says the writer to the Hebrews, but was in all points tested and tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God by him because he ever lives to make intercession for them. Now, isn't this a glorious thing? You see, one of the things about human monarchs is that they tend to be rather remote. They are the sort of people you can scarcely approach. I don't know if you've ever been at one of these garden parties in Edinburgh, you know. We, for some strange reason, get an invitation there every year. I've concluded it's because I go to open the high court with prayer from time to time and therefore they invite us to the garden party. But when you go there, you know, you happen to see the Queen, and everybody who is invited, you're invited to this rather special occasion. You'll come and meet the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, and all the rest. Then you go, 
and there are 10,000 people there waiting to meet them and they come down surrounded by guards of all different kinds and they walk down through this little place and maybe if you manage to get past the lady's hat you can just about see her there is a remoteness about it all you see but my dear friends there is a glorious intimacy that we enjoy with the King of Kings and that He actually enjoys with us. This is the glorious thing about having such a Savior at the right hand of God as Jesus. He is intimately acquainted with every single situation that you're ever in. There is nothing that touches your life. But He is not able to reach out His hand and say, My child, I understand it to the nth degree. Oh, you say, but he couldn't possibly understand all the things that afflict me day by day. Well, listen to what he says. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with our infirmity, but was in all points tested like as we are. And he is able to draw us to his heart. And to say, my child, I understand. And then he bears that need before his father. That's what Jesus ascended to the right hand of God to do. But there is something even more than that. Why has he gone to heaven? He has gone to heaven to reign in order that we might rest in his sovereignty. He has gone to heaven to intercede in order that we might gain the confidence of Peter when Jesus said to him, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, but I have prayed for you. And he has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us. I go, said Jesus, to prepare a place for you and I will come again and receive you unto myself. He has entered heaven, you see, not only as a mighty conqueror, but as our forerunner. So the same letter to the Hebrews, which as you will be gathering has a lot to say about the ascension, says we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, which enters within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. And what Jesus has done as he enters into the presence of the Father is as it were, to have an anchor cast there and we are anchored as it were at the other end of it and the security of the believer that as Jesus is in heaven now I shall be in heaven one day is that he has gone in as a forerunner to prepare a place for us and that's the anchor for my soul And we may have that glorious assurance concerning our personal future this morning. I spent some time yesterday speaking with someone who is dying. And I was urging this upon her in hospital. That Jesus is there now at the right hand of the Father. And if we have our anchor cast upon him, there is nothing in the whole universe more certain than that he will sweep us into the glory with him when we leave this world. It poses a problem, it proclaims a message, it provides a comfort, and it presents a challenge the whole message of the ascension of Jesus. The right hand of God, you see, at which he sat down. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And that is the place of universal authority. It is to this that Jesus is referring when he says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now the evidence that all authority is truly given to Jesus in heaven and on earth is in his ascension. He is sitting now at the place where all authority in heaven and earth belongs and that is the place at the right hand of the Father. All authority on earth belongs to him 
and all authority in heaven belongs to him. And this is why he goes on to say to his disciples, all authority, all power, some of the translations have it, but it's really all authority. All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Now, do you see the point of this? Only because all authority on earth belongs to Jesus can we go to all nations knowing that all nations owe him sovereign allegiance, that all nations are the area he designs for his gospel to go to, that the Christian gospel does not belong to, belong to one section of society or one area of the world, it is the universal authority of Jesus over the earth that makes it possible for us to go to all nations calling upon them to repent and believe and bow down before this Jesus. And it is only because all authority in heaven belongs to him that we can be assured of the prosperity of the gospel wherever it is preached. Because all authority in heaven, that is to grant repentance and forgiveness of sins and eternal life, as Paul says, this authority belongs to the Lord Jesus and his ex exaltation and ascension. Proclaim that to us. So we may go out into the world with confidence to bring the gospel to every creature knowing that all authority belongs to him in heaven and earth. And we must go out into the world to proclaim the gospel to every creature because that authority of Jesus is exercised over us this morning. Now that's the final challenge. Let me bring it home to you if I may. Jesus is waiting. Do you notice this? He is sitting to declare that all his work is ended. He is reigning to declare that he is Lord over all the earth and all the heavens. He is waiting, waiting until all his enemies should be made a stool for his feet. How does Jesus extend his kingdom and draw men into it and bring people under his sovereignty? He does it through the preaching of his gospel. And this is what Jesus is waiting for, waiting patiently until his enemies shall be made his footstool. Now you see, there are two places in the universe where God designs that his son will be enthroned. One is at his right hand where God has already exalted him and given him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. But you see the second place where Jesus designs that, where God designs that Jesus should be enthroned. It is in the lives of people like ourselves here this morning. And the ascension of Jesus bears witness to this. Has he ascended up on high in your life to a place of supreme authority and absolute sovereignty? Or have you a controversy with God about where he has placed the Lord Jesus? and where you are seeking to place him. That's the real challenge of the ascension. And my dear friends, we need to take it seriously. Because the day is coming when he will wait no longer. And every knee, voluntarily or involuntarily, will bow. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we worship Thee and we desire with all our hearts that our whole being 
may be thy footstool, we would gladly give ourselves to this today that we may be under thy sovereignty, crowning thee, Lord of all. We ask it for thy name's sake. Amen.